hell than he did about heaven. And he describes it even more vividly. There's no denying that Jesus knew, believed, and warned against the absolute reality of hell. Even a cursory reading of the gospel shows Jesus talked about it plenty. In fact, he talked about hell more than any other person in the Bible. I'm talking about your Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 16, he describes a great chasm over which none, none may cross from there to us. In Matthew 25, he tells about a time when people will be separated into two groups. One group entering into his presence and the other banished to eternal fire. Come on, is there anybody who wants to hear the truth this morning? Wave at me today if you want to hear the truth. Come on. Jesus, not only does he reference hell, he describes it in great detail. He says it's a place of eternal torment, Luke 16, 23. He describes it as a place of unquenchable fire, Mark 9, 43. He says it's a place where the worm does not die, Mark 9, 48. He says it's a place where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret, Matthew 13 and verse 42. He says it's a place from which there is no return, even to warn loved ones, Luke 16. It's a place of outer darkness. He compared it to Gehenna, which was a trash dump out outside of the city of Jerusalem where there was constant fire. I'm just telling you today that Jesus has to talk about hell because it is the fate that awaits all people apart from him. You say, Pastor, why are you preaching this? Let me tell you why. It's because if we don't begin there how will we ever have an understanding about the importance of missions how will we ever have an understanding that church really is not a playground come on somebody that we're not pretending today that we're just going through some kind of motions the truth is because of Adam's sin we're all guilty and deserve God's eternal punishment Contrary to popular belief, hell is not a place where God sends those who are especially wicked. No, it's our default destination. We need a rescuer. We'll stand condemned. We, and so we're left really with two options. We can stay in our state of depravity and be eternally punished, or we can submit to the Savior and accept His gift of redemption. How many of you are glad that you've accepted His gift of redemption? Come on, give the Lord Jesus a hand of praise today. You say, well, what does this have to do with me? Let me tell you something. This is the most important question of anyone's life. What do will you do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'll tell you, it's more important than the college you attend, how much money you make, how long you live, where you go to church, who you marry. It's the most important question that you will ever ponder because it has eternal ramifications. Will I accept what Christ has done for me? Will I turn from my sins and accept His free gift of salvation and forgiveness? And if we really get a hold of this issue today, it will cause us to understand that the, the gospel must must be taken to the ends of the world. They will pastor what is God's plan to get the message out? Question number three. Surely God has a plan. How many of you know that God has a plan? Come on, are you grateful for God's plan? Before we answer that question, I want to I wanna give you some, uh, some questions about false assumptions that people have. You're still with me today, all right? Okay, here's one question. Can the lost not find God in nature. Isn't it possible for people just to view nature and find God? The answer to that is that while nature testifies of God and even of His attributes, no one will be saved in the name of Mother Nature. The earth is not the way, the truth, and the life. Come on, that's Jesus. Come on. There's not one example in all of the Bible of uh, someone looking at nature and finding God. I'm sorry. I've read it from the beginning to the end in two languages, and it's not in there. Now, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, there is an interesting verse. How many of you are still with me today? I know I'm preaching pretty deep theologically here today. It says this, For since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. And then notice the next few verses. What does it say? So that they're without excuse. It doesn't say they can find their own way through nature. 
But what happens is people read this verse and they start adding their own thoughts to it and they think, isn't that wonderful? That guy out there in the jungle, he can look up and he can see the trees and the mountains and the sunset and he'll be there in heaven with us. Listen, the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, why don't you, instead of reading one verse, how about reading the whole, the whole chapter? Come on. In fact, let's not just read the whole chapter. Let's read the whole book of Romans. Come on, somebody. Because you see, Paul is setting forth his doctrine of justification by faith and he's building his logic precept upon precept and if you read the book of Romans you'll discover that his first point is this that God is pouring out his wrath against mankind because all of mankind are without excuse second point God's judgment is righteous because we're all sinners Jews Gentile heathen and whatever we're all in the same boat and then he gets to the third point which is the great point the good point are you ready to shout this morning come on somebody there is a righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ hallelujah he gives us that righteousness it is his gift that righteousness is our only hope and finally the fourth point he finally reaches a conclusion in Romans chapter 10 where he says these words he comes that argument that he's been building comes to a conclusion Romans 10 and verse 14 where he says this how then can they call on the one they have not believed in how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? Listen, if it was God's point in the book of Romans to say they can be saved through nature, he would have said right there, all they got to do is look at the sunset and know that there's a God and they'll be fine. But it does not say that. It's obvious that they cannot. How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Come on. That's why the Great Commission is of concern to every single person today. Let me give you another question. Well, can angels preach to them? Can angels preach? Uh, I mean, I just know God loves everybody over there so much. He's going to send an angel. Let me tell you something. God never told the angels, go and preach the gospel. That's what he told the church to do. Go into all the word and preach the gospel to every creature. Those words were written through his disciples. We cannot put off on angels what we are responsible to do ourselves. God said for us to go, and if we can't go, then it's our responsibility to send someone. Come on, somebody say amen today, man. I'm preaching the best I can up here. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 10, we got a great story of a guy by the name of Cornelius, he was a devout man, a seeker, a religious man. He prayed to God. He gave to God regularly, but he did not understand the gospel. And it says that God sent to him an angel. Well, let's see what happened. Did the angel preach the gospel to him? Let's go and see. Acts 10, 13 says this. It says, he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Well, what happened? Did the angel tell him about Jesus? Did he preach the gospel to him? Did the angel sit down and start discipling him? No, he did not. And he says in the, a couple of verse later, he said, Now send me, the angel told him, Send men to Joppa and bring back a man by the name of Simon who's called Peter, and he will tell you what to do. You see, God, the angels of heaven understand that the preaching of the gospel, the making of disciples, has been given to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching good today. I'm preaching the Word today. Now I want you to know, in the marvelous, wonderful grace of God, there will come a day when the, when the angels will preach the everlasting gospel. That's true. The angels will do. But let me tell you what. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not going to be in the earth that, during that season because we're going to be raptured out. Come on. That will happen during the tribulation when the church is gone. But until that day, it's our responsibility to preach the gospel. Well, you say, well, Pastor, can God just not reveal himself? Will God just not show, you know, shout down out of heaven? Will God reveal himself? I mean, isn't that what happened to Saul? Wasn't he on the road to Damascus and all of a sudden he saw a great light and he heard a voice from heaven? It's an interesting thought. Let's see if Jesus preached the gospel to him. How many of you are with me today? Acts chapter 9 and verse 3 says this, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice from 
say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? What did Saul say? What? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, did Jesus preach the gospel right there? Did he say, Saul, what I need you to do is to believe on me, to repent of your sins, to confess me as your Lord and Savior. If you, Jesus didn't do any of that, notice what he said. He said, now get up and go into the city and it will be told you what to do. If you read the rest of the chapter, you'll understand that a guy by the name of Ananias came to Saul, prayed for him, put his hands upon him, and he got, got healed him of his blindness. And yes, God revealed his gospel to Saul, but I'm going to hear today to tell you that the preaching of the gospel has always been the responsibility of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You say, well, pastor, can they find out by reading the Bible? How many of you love the Bible? Come on. Did you, how many brought your Bible to church today? Wait, wave it at me. Oh, I know some of you brought an e-book. Some of you brought a tree book. It's all right. As long as you got the word with you. Come on you got to have your sword somewhere. Hello. Some of you carry it kind of incognito in your back pocket and you just pull it out. You've got that app right there. Come on. You are not a soldier without a sword. Hello. I love the Word of God. And we ought to do our very best to get the Word of God everywhere. How many of you love, how many have ever been in a hotel room and found a Gideon's Bible there? Amen. Don't, don't take those. Leave those there. Okay. All right. Unless you really need a Bible. Yeah, I guess the Gideons would be all right with it. All right. But it, I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could put a Bible in every house? How about a Bible in every house in all the world? Would that do the job of world evangelization? I wonder what the Word has to say about that. Let's look at the book of Acts chapter 8. How many of you know that Acts, the book of Acts is a powerful thing? It is Acts 8. Yes, it is. All right. Uh, there's a guy who was an Ethiopian, all right? An Ethiopian eunuch, the Bible says. And he was reading the Word of God. He had a copy of one of the scrolls of Isaiah. He was actually reading Isaiah chapter 53, which is one of the most powerful and profound descriptions of Jesus' death on the cross that you'll ever find. I mean, he had just read these words. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He had just read these words, all we like sheep have gone astray but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all and, and God spoke to Philip to go up to this guy who's in this uh, I suppose it was a chariot and, and talk to him and he asked him this question Acts 8 and verse 30 he said do you understand what you are reading Philip asked Wait a minute, he's reading a very passage about Jesus. This is about Jesus on the cross, the substitutionary atonement, the very fact that Jesus took our place so that we can have life. He took our place on the cross. We've heard it preached a thousand times in America. Come on, somebody. But this is what he says. Do you understand what you're reading? And notice what Philip said. You know what he said? How can I? How can I unless someone explains it to me? You see, giving someone a Bible is a good thing. I'm not saying don't do it. Do it. Get them to read the Bible. But stay there and be able to tell them. Because they're going to have questions. Is there anybody who's ever read the Bible and had a question? Come on. You'll read it. Sometimes we need it explained to us. Amen. This is, the, this is where the gospel is so powerful and important. That's why God needs every single one of us to be ready, prepared to share the gospel. Amen. I'm telling you, church, we cannot depend on Bible distribution alone. Amen. You say, well, what is God's plan to get the message out? God's plan is to use the church to proclaim and advance the gospel. Come on. We become cooperators with the Holy Spirit in this endeavor. It's not that we can go save people. Come on. I, I'll tell you something. Sometimes I, I read, my, read something on Facebook about where this pastor healed somebody. Let me tell you something. No pastor can heal anybody. Hello? The only one that can heal anybody is Jesus Christ. Come on. And you can't save anybody either. You can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. You can share the good news. You can proclaim it. You can tell it. You can tell what God has done for you. You can testify. You can do all those things. But Jesus is the Savior. He gets all the credit and he gets all the glory. 
and we are his voice on the earth. And I just want you to understand today